Hello everyone and welcome back to day two of the iHub Integrated Design Symposium. My name is Marie Karekla, ERA's Engagement and Program Coordinator. So yesterday um, in day one, we explored the latest updates to the data centers and zero carbon design, um, looking at it from a student's perspective. And today we will receive an update from the University of Wollongong um, and also explore the IDS aquatic and aged care facilities. But just before we do begin the session, um, if anyone does have any questions for any of our presenters today, um, please type them into the Q&A function that's located just at the bottom of your screen and um, we will allow for some time um, to get through as many questions as possible in the time permitting. Um, so now I'd like to pass things over to ERA's Chief Executive Officer and Chair of the Innovation Hub for Affordable Heating and Cooling, Tony Gleeson. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Marie, and hello to everybody and welcome back to the second part of this program. Uh, before we begin, I think it's always important to recognise uh, not only the contributors to this, but the journey we've been on as part of this uh, Innovation Hub. And also to recognise, I think, where we actually meet from here today. And in particular, I'm sitting on the grounds of the Wurundjeri people as part of the Kula Nation here in Melbourne. And I also want to pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of the Aboriginal people that they bring to our community. And uh, with that, I'd also like to then recognise ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, that has been a significant supporter and contributor to these projects, in particular through their Advancing Renewables programs. And they have been uh, very supportive of what we've been doing. Particularly, I'd like to also like to thank the people who have been part of this journey. And you can see on the current slide, we have a significant number of people who've contributed. Everything from the ACT government, uh, government Ambulance Victoria, there are many there and I really want to support, thank those supporters who have made a significant difference to what we've been doing. So at this point, uh, I want to thank everyone for being involved, and I'd like to hand that over. I think it's to Brendan uh, McNiven. Uh, Brendan, again, thank you for through Melbourne University and the work that you've done to progress these projects on. By the way, it's not over, folks. We've still got a part of the journey to go. We're about two thirds away most of the projects, so please keep in, stay in tuned in what we're doing because this isn't over. It's somewhere close to the halfway point. Over to you, Brendan. Thank you for your support and work. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Marie. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'd like to acknowledge Arena and ERA for the massive support and funding and roles they've had in actually getting everything going as well. It's been great. So welcome to day two of the program. So the broad theme for today is, uh, is practices, and we've got some great presentations lined up. We've got James and Emma from Wollongong are going to tell us about the experiences in the integrated design studios that happened up there. Uh, we've got Chris Buntine from Northrop and uh, he's also a driver behind Engineers Declare. He's going to talk about how integrated design can help professionals respond to the climate emergency. Um, and then we've got some, a great couple of presentations on the schools IDS that happened. Um, one of the first uh, IDSs so we've got uh, Joe Letteri and Trish Stocker um, going to tell us about the consultant perspective for the studios. And then we've got Beth Mitchell from the ACT Education Directorate is going to give us um, the, the view from the client's side, I guess. And then uh, at the end of that, we've got some people lined up to, to stay on for half an hour to have a bit of a panel discussion about things at the end. So it should be a good afternoon. Um, so with that, I might hand over to James and Emma. Thanks, Brendan. As Brendan mentioned, I'm presenting with uh, my colleague, James Roth. We're both from the University of Wollongong, and we've been running four design studios at UOW this year. Um, so I'm Dr. Emma Heffernan. I'm the Academic Programme Director, Senior Lecturer in Architectural Engineering, which is a new major at UOW. Um, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, 
I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of um, the land on which I live and work, the Wadi Wadi people of Darawal country. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we've, we've um, run four integrated design studios um, at UOW this year, uh, two in the autumn session and two are currently ongoing in spring session. Um, the, this slide just provides a bit of an overview and we'll go through all four of those um, at quite a high level, a um, bit of a whistle stop tour. And then we'll also touch on some observations that we've had um, within and across those different IDSs. Um, so, in autumn session, we delivered to uh, across um, combined subjects to architectural, civil, environmental and mechanical engineering disciplines. Um, and those were both undergraduate and postgraduate students um, across those subjects. Uh, whereas in spring, it's a, a um, it, there's less diversity in terms of the disciplines and that's to undergraduate students. We had an existing building um, of a community centre in the first session, as well as a residential aged care facility. Um, and then this session, we're doing buildings for two um, Aboriginal land councils. So the structure of the studios that we run, they've been single semester studios um, and the structures kind of provided here in this overview. The students have worked on two tasks in the early stage, which have been group tasks, and then they've moved on to do some individual tasks. And there's obviously been um, consultant engagement. This is from the first session when we were able to do um, delivery in dual mode. And we also had a site visit to the existing building. Um, so that first building is Ribbonwood Centre, which is a community centre and library. It's located in Dapto in the Illawarra. Um, and it was constructed pre-section J in 2000. Um, and it's planned by Wollongong City Council to um, refurbish that building within the next two to five years. Um, and as an organisation, Wollongong City Council has um, a, a commitment to become net zero in operation by 2030. So there's good alignment in terms of what we were trying to achieve within the IDS and what they're trying to achieve as an organisation. Um, so the brief that came from um, the client was very much around looking at the building systems and services, HVAC plant, lighting services, fixtures and fit fittings, which had exceeded their service life. Um, but there are also issues with thermal comfort, plant noise and accessibility. And we were able to get some good insights on that through the site visit that we um, went on with the students. Um, the students started by looking at an analysis of the site and brief to understand the constraints and opportunities um, and moved on to trying to establish what the business as usual would be for, um, for that building type. We actually had some metered data uh, from the client, so that was somewhat helpful, although it was quite difficult to benchmark um, because there wasn't a huge amount of data available for the particular building type that we were looking at. Um, so the students uh, you know, look, found what information they could and, and worked out how to set some targets um, to achieve the net zero. The next stage that they moved on to was idea generation and, and assessment and ranking of those ideas. So within the Ribbonwood IDS, um, they were able to identify 44 different concept ideas that some of the students uh, work to categorise those. So looking at building based electrical HVAC um, and on the right here, we can see a decision matrix um, with, where they've used a traffic light system to uh, identify which are maybe the most appropriate solutions to try to progress a bit further. Um, so students use weighting, assessment and ranking in order to, to work out which individual um, design ideas to then progress um, on their own. So they use tools such as Open Studio with SketchUp um, to look at ideas around um, building fabric improvements. Um, there's a large west facing glazed um, atrium in the building. So there were ideas around green wall shading systems and also integration of further PV to extend what was already on the building. Um, the other IDS that we ran was with Lend Lease, and that's a residential aged care facility. So there's a health and wellbeing precinct, which is planned um, in collaboration with the University of Wollongong to create an intergenerational university community where people can live, but also um, there are healthcare, social facilities, and, and a strong focus on wellbeing um, and linking that with the educational delivery at University of Wollongong. Um, and again, Lendlease has a commitment to net zero by 2030. So this is currently in the concept DA stage. So the students had a bit of a design that they were working with. Um, 
but not an existing building. The client was able to provide um, lots of, of um, briefing information about what they wanted within the scheme, um, decisions being based around costs, affordability and comfort. Um, but they also had a strong focus on salutogenesis, that is um, in environments which are health giving um, and, and can actually help people um, not just to not get worse, but also to get better. Um, issues around accessibility and dementia design principles were also incorporated. Um, so again, the students went through the same um, process of looking at the site and the brief analysis, identifying constraints, working out uh, what metrics to work with. In the context of the residential aged care, they were putting those metrics often um, in a per bed per year um, format so that that was meaningful in the context of the project. Um, and there was a bit of data on this sector that they were able to work with. Um, and so they were identifying targets, not just for energy, but also for water and waste. Um, again, they went through a ranking um, assessment process using matrices, and they were able within this studio to identify 77 concept design ideas, um, categorize, weight and, and rank them, um, and then move on to working on some individual solutions. And here we've got an example of a student working with Design Builder and MATLAB to look at optimizing um, the glazing and shading for natural lighting, heating load, cooling load, and lighting load, um, and coming up with what the best combination of um, solutions were there. Um, so some of the observations quickly before I hand over to James, um, within the IDS for the existing building, we found that the students felt a bit more constrained, that they found there was less flexibility, um, and they tended to um, move towards more standard solutions such as shading, PV, glazing, um, and although there was some out-of-the-box thinking evidence, um, thinking about uh, wastewater heat recovery um, and things like that, um, the fact that it was an existing building and we had a site visit enabled them to have some discussions with existing building occupants and to, to have some, um, some input in terms of what the important aspects of the building to, to improve were. And they're also able to take some spot measurements in that context. Um, in terms of the student and consultant observations, um, that we've, we've already gathered um, because that was earlier in the year. Uh, the students were 100% positive in terms of the consultant involvement in the project. Um, they felt, as I said, a bit constrained by the design flexibility and um, some of the, the client brief and assignment constraints. The consultants felt that the, the single semester um, was quite constraining as well, 100% positive about um, the benefits to the students. Um, so I'll hand over now to James. Thanks for that, Emma. Um, so looking at the, the IDSs that we ran um, this session, so the first IDS was run in conjunction with the Illawarra Local Aboriginal Land Council. Um, so they've uh, acquired the site of the former Unandera police station. Um, and as you can see from some of the photos, it's in a bit of a rundown site. Uh, sorry, uh, it's a bit run down at the moment. Um, so the, the Land Council offered this as a, as a case study for the students and uh, the students were able to, to explore the possibility of either refurbishing the building or doing a complete knockdown rebuild. Um, however, if that was the case, the students needed to do an environmental impact assessment. Um, so they had some considerations about where exactly they were going with the project. Um, the client was also very open as to what the, the function of the building was going to be. Um, so they were, they were open to the idea of it being designed as, um, a, as uh, office spaces for use by the land council, but were also open to it being um, developed into a, a residential building or um, being developed for retail and commercial purposes, as this would open um, revenue streams for the land council, which could be utilised in uh, additional projects. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. Um, the, the second uh, IDS that we're currently running is um, in conjunction with the, the Lightning Ridge Local Aboriginal Land Council and the Dr. Steve Burroughs Foundation. 
Um, so as you can see from the photo here, we've been given a, a blank site, which is um, all for their designs. Uh, so the students in this project were contracted to design and develop a, a multi-purpose building um, for in um, Lightning Ridge. So this, uh, this building was going to be used uh, mostly for community gatherings, but also offer some um, opportunities around um, uh, uh, commercial, um, I guess, incentives for the Lightning Ridge community. So they were going to be looking at um, developing um, some shops, uh, a cafe and a restaurant within the, within the building. Um, in addition to that, the multi-purpose building also had to include the, um, the offices for the, for the land council. So it is quite a substantial design that they were undertaking. Uh, next slide, please. So here we can see some examples of the student work. So um, they followed a similar process as to the, the previous IDSs, where the students undertook a, um, a site analysis and a return brief to the client, um, and then started examining um, the, the spaces that were required within these buildings. So that's the, uh, the bubble diagram in the lower left corner there. Um, so seeing how those spaces were going to interact with one another, um, and then further developing that along with um, utilizing some of the matrices that Emma was talking about before to develop a floor plan and a finalized design, as you can see in some of these visuals here. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the initial observations that we've, um, that we've seen throughout this project is um, uh, a new development definitely offers a, a much larger flexibility in the design solutions that the students can explore. However, the students are almost overwhelmed by the amount of opportunities available to them. Um, and because they, they lack um, uh, a certain direction in which they're heading, they, they get a little bit lost, so it's slowed. Um, however, having a new development, we did notice that uh, the students considered a lot more of the, the aesthetic of the building and how the architecture can be used to solve some of the uh, environmental and energy considerations that the clients were after. Um, this also resulted in a much larger sort of holistic design uh, where students were, were integrating their uh, specific uh, engineering technologies and the architecture together. Uh, so one example of that is one of the groups wanted to, to integrate a green roof with their design, which is something that needs to be um, considered in early stages of the development and can't just be adapted towards uh, a, uh, when you've got a, um, a finalized design or an existing structure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've got a preliminary comparison of these studios. Um, so we've got uh, two studios that utilize an existing structure and two that looked at more new developments. Um, now, one of those offer, uh, had a lot more restriction around what the students were, were able to explore, whereas one had almost uh, too much freedom. Uh, and so moving forward, if there are additional IDSs, um, we sort of need more of a, a happy medium somewhere in between there. Um, some of these IDSs were also run online and some face-to-face. -face. So for the face-to-face -face IDSs, we saw that there was a lot more engagement with the students and the consultants, um, and this was less apparent online. Um, however, the online wasn't just negatives. Um, each week, when, uh, as it was going by, the students were almost doing mini presentations each week, exposing uh, their own work to the rest of the cohort. So everyone got to see where the other groups were at in developing their ideas. Um, and they also got to sort of take some of the ideas the other students were presenting and try and integrate those within their own designs. Uh, we have found that students do tend to stray towards the familiar though. Um, so with these design studios, they are trying to, to further develop themselves and, um, and I guess expand uh, their skill set away from their um, specific studies. Um, however, we also have to keep in mind that the students are undertaking these as a subject at university. And with that comes a mark. Um, and so, especially when it comes to individual assessments, they're going to slip back into where they're more comfortable so they can try and maximize those marks for their studies. Um, we also have to be mindful of the cohort mixes. So for these studies, um, we, we had postgraduate and older undergraduate students undertaking one of the IDSs, whereas for 
um, the second lot of IDS is we had a much younger cohort. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. And then our final observations. So we found that, well, the IDS has definitely empowered the participants to overcome any preconceived conceptions uh, around um, their specific fields. Um, and so we've got uh, two examples there on the screen. Um, we also found that introducing specific frameworks, um, such as the, the matrices, allowed students to analyze different strategies and technologies um, and give a weighting to each one of those so that they can see which of those strategies are, are most beneficial for the project that they're, um, they're undertaking. Uh, it gives a bit of a, a justification as to why they're implementing the strategies that they are. Uh, and then lastly, the importance of feedback mechanisms. So providing feedback to the students was hugely important for them. Um, whether this feedback came from their peers, studio tutors, clients, or consultants, um, it greatly assisted the students in um, moving their designs forward and developing them even further. Um, without those feedback mechanisms, um, it's almost like the students are just undertaking a regular assessment at uni. Um, next slide. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I think we sort of blitzed through everything, but if anyone does have any questions, then please feel free to ask. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, James. Um, we'll have some time for questions. So I might just jump in with one that was on my mind is um, moderator's privilege, which is uh, I was really interested to see the 44 and 77 options and the um, matrices and traffic light system. Um, it strikes me as a very engineering thing. You know, I think if you look inside many engineers' heads, you'll see a, a gigantic spreadsheet. Um, did you notice different ways of thinking and dealing with the options uh, from different types of students in the studios? That's a good question, Brendan. Um, they definitely dealt with them in different ways. And some of them, um, you know, some of them had quite complex approaches to that weighting and, and ranking. But I think having a framework, you know, having, the, I think whoever you are, an ability to understand, you know, whether, whether you're an architect, an architect or an engineer, having the ability to try to put different options on a level playing field and to at least be able to have a set of, of lenses that you can look at them through, um, helps in that decision making um, and they certainly yeah they they looked at at grouping them in different ways and some of them I think maybe started with the categories and then tried to populate those categories whereas others started with a like you know blitz it and and then uh, how do we how do we make sense of this um, but I don't know that we necessarily or differences across the disciplines. Um, bearing in mind, you know, in, in probably in contrast to some of the other IDSs, obviously, ours are all engineering students. We have architectural engineering students and, and other disciplines, but they're all, you know, they're not coming from an architecture discipline. Mm. They're, they're still fundamentally engineers, but engineers with a focus on, on buildings, even, um, even the architectural engineering students. So um, I guess you know it, I'll be interested when we when we look at the big picture of all of the IDSs how that that comparison um, can inform us. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think there's some quite stark differences between the different IDSs, so it will be interesting when we pull them all together. Um, I can see Paul's got his hand up. Paul, did you have a, a question? It just got a um, an observation from the students uh, that we've been working through with uh, Wendy Miller around, uh, particularly the architectural students. They and this is a question for the panel for the people who have you know you know you've been going through a similar process. But the students, by and large, we've been finding do that research component really well. You know they they, they get lots of stuff together, but there's that trans translation between the research and actually delivering it on the ground. We saw lots of discussions and so forth, and we're yet to have our uh, final design presentation, which will occur in a couple of weeks. But how is that a common experience that we're seeing in other universities, or is it just our cohort? I'm interested in comments about that. I I think we saw some struggles in that tran that translation. Yeah, certainly. I think, and that's I think where where James's point about 
people um, reverting to the familiar, that that it was at, at that point that, um, you know, certainly so, so many of our students hadn't had experience previously with Design Build or with Open Studio. And so it was a new set of tools that they were using and to, to layer onto that doing something innovative or difficult. You know, one of the students wanted to look at doing an atrium and what benefit that would have. And, you know, the complexity of doing a design builder model of an atrium is beyond many, you know, um, practicing engineers or, or certainly it might test them. Um, James, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, well, not really. I think, I think you've mostly address the point um yeah no not much not much else to add sorry I, I, I might jump in there because um i think it's a good observation and one of the things we saw in our integrated design studios and please patricia joe dominic jump in here if you if you want to add something but we, we found that the results of the designs at mid-semester um weren't as inspiring as we thought and and we figured out after a couple of studios it's because the students are getting up to speed with what's business as usual and that's that's why it's so important to have the consultants on board because the consultants have been around the block a few times and they're they're far more comfortable dealing with the different concepts and they've, they've probably got a, a bigger pool of concepts to deal with as well to bring into the, the table to be a, a design author which which is particularly on the engineering side we found a lot of the engineers struggled to be design authors that are far more comfortable having a solution given to them that they could then comment on. And, and that's important too. So we, we, we saw empathetic engineering where people took a, uh, an architectural solution and figured out a good engineering solution to go to it. And that's, that's good integrated design, but really I think the holy grail is to have the engineers and the architects come up with an idea together that works at both levels at the same time. You know, it's, it's about that all being greater than the sum of the parts. And Brendan, did you have an issue with the, I mean, what happens with students, and you see it just about every subject, is that the last minute factor, you know, where they crunch everything in the last week or whatever, and that's kind of really contradictory to the what you're trying to get them experienced through the IDS. And once again, we're yet to see the results, but um, we've had some fantastic dialogue along the way. But in, in some respects, actually, maybe the observation is it's good because it forces the students to actually make some progress earlier because you can't coordinate something in the last week. Uh, but is that a common experience with everyone? Well, we, we definitely saw a huge amount of work and a huge, huge amount of ideation in, in the last weeks. And, and I think that's a human nature thing. I'm interested, Joe, Dominic, do you have a, a comment on that? I'm smiling because um, isn't that normal? <laughs> a lot of architectural students can do amazing things overnight. So um, that's certainly, we saw a bit of that, but um, I guess in the integrated design model, they couldn't really do the shortcut as quickly as they would in a, in a more conceptual based studio because they had to have done the work and they had to have kind of showed the, the technical um, thinking and, and integrated approach throughout. Maybe we one, one comment from my end, there is a, there's a potential danger of a confirmation bias that the architecture students, when they get their hands on some sort of um, analysis software, uh, get some outcomes and very quickly jump into believing what they are seeing, even though they are not really quite able to interpret what the results are. And uh, so we have to be mindful of that and careful. And I think, I think we had bigger successes if they actually have somebody explain them uh, in more detail, and this is why working together in an integrated fashion is really useful as an education process as well, of course, these dialogues where they realize, okay, this is what that actually means, that color, and if I, it's it's not just something that the computer spits out for me. So really being able to question the results is a really important part of that learning process. All right, look, um, that's some good discussion. We we might leave it there. There's a, there's a question there from Hinghua from uh, Victoria University in in Melbourne on how COVID affected things, but I think we'll probably get around to that a bit later on because in the preamble to the, the session, we'd already even started to talk about that. So I think it's a great question and there's things to, to look at on that front, but we might do that um, a little bit later on. So we're going to hear now from Chris Bunting from Northrop Engineers and uh, also, um, like I said, a, a strong driver behind Engineers Declare movement. So Chris, take it away. Great, uh, hopefully you can see my screen, hear me okay. Um, 
Good afternoon, everybody. This is a great discussion and appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. I think uh, integrated design is such a critical, you know, skill and process. And I'm going to talk from a slightly different perspective. I guess it's a, it's a little bit higher level, a little higher in urgency almost, uh, coming from the point of uh, can integrated design help us address the climate and biodiversity emergency? And wearing two hats in my case, one at Northrop, where I'm a sustainability manager, working with project teams uh, to drive sustainability outcomes, but also um, a coordinator with Engineers Declare Network, uh, which I've done for the last uh, almost two years, uh, just being involved in those discussions across the industry. So um, just get my slides moving. So I guess the starting point, and, and I'm gonna be speaking a little bit through the lens of an engineer, that was my original training, um, but, but really it's representing other built environment professionals, particularly architects. Um, um, but, you know, there's, there's this recognition that, that we have some incredible skills these days in engineering and architecture and others, uh, but we've also, we're also quite, quite guilty, quite responsible, I guess, for, for bringing, um, you know, things like climate change uh, to, to where we are today and, and having ignored those issues for a long time and the, the World Meteorological Association just uh, organization just come out today I guess and said we're we're accelerating the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere despite what happened uh, last year with changes in the way we live and work we're at 413 parts uh, 0.2 parts per million not heading in a good direction we have not figured out actually how to how to turn things around yet so that urgency is just ramping up and we'll see that with COP26 coming up. So um, the uh, engineers declare, and there's also architects declare, planners declare, builders declare, uh, communicators declare, there's quite a few of those declare movements, but it's really about going public and making a commitment as an individual uh, and as an organization in the case of engineers declare to say, look, we, we need to uh, create systems, infrastructure technology that has a positive impact and there's there's a you know 12 declaration points there, um, and it's that public declaration that's been really instrumental in driving action. Uh, and I can speak from experience. North takes it very seriously, and there's a whole raft of things that we're doing uh, internally to change the way we work. And that's true of many other um, uh, engineering consultants out there. And this commitment was really key. Um, and so, you know, it's nearly 2,000 uh, individuals um, and 177 or so organisations. It's not an, um, you know, Engineers Declare is not um, an organisation. It's not going to go off and do anything. Engineers Declare is us, as is Architects Declare. It's about what we, what we can do uh, and to collaborate and to drive in terms of, of change. Um, and here's a few of the commitments that are in that declaration. I've just, just pulled out three of the 12 here, really. And, and in bold, you can see some of the things they're talking about in terms of regenerative design, whole of system, whole of life approaches, circular economy, you know, th th this kind of capability, capacity to drive these things um, is, is something that integrated design can absolutely uh, help with. Um, and so it's really built into those commitments as a recognition that we need to change the way that we work, the way that we design, the way we collaborate. Uh, to be able to achieve these outcomes. If we keep doing working the same way we've been working for, for many decades, we'll get the same results. And that's just not gonna work in terms of, uh, you know, kind of climate and biodiversity and a raft of other uh, uh, issues around the sustainability of our communities and our planet. Um, and, and there's a recognition by uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering recently published an article saying, look, engineers are going to face some real challenges in tackling the climate crisis because the, the, uh, the impacts are novel, unique, complex, unbounded. They're wicked problems uh, and we need a different uh, skill set in the engineering workforce. We need creativity, interdisciplinarity, flexibility, motivation. You know, these are things that haven't, they're certainly not strong points in the, in the, in the current suite of professionals out there who we are really relying on in terms of uh, driving change. We, we, we welcome the students coming in, but there's a lot we need to do uh, in the next five to 10 years. So we do need current uh, professionals to be able to step up um, and, and then obviously the, the right training to happen. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's some real challenges there. In, in, um, and I know that the institutions represented in this panel and others are, are working on it. Um, 
Dominique Hess, who we all know well, recently wrote an article on how do we build a regenerative brain um, and uh, recognises that we've focused on, on, on left brain thinking. Uh, and that's left us quite, um, quite uh, you know, unable or, or with a gap in, in, in their capabilities to be able to, to do some of the things that integrated design is asking us to do, to be able to see patterns, to be more intuitive, to make connections. And you can see this if you look at the right brain, the list of right brain, uh, you know, uh, capabilities there, big picture, looking at holes, you know, intuitive, holistic, uh, you know, innovation, spon spon spontaneous, et cetera, uh, risk taking. There's a whole lot of things we actually want to promote. And, um, and they, they are uh, not things that we've promoted. Uh, and, and I can tell you working with engineers and uh, you know, on many projects, they're real weak points. And so um, that's a challenge. So I'm really interested in stories we can tell each other about what integrated design really is. And I was fascinated by this one that we tell our primary school kids. And some of you may have this book, there's very variations of it, Stone Soup. You know, the, uh, and it's, a, it's a, you know, an old story uh, about a stranger that walks into a village and the, there's a great famine on and uh, people are struggling to eat, but he comes in and just uh, sets up a fire under a pot and throws a stone in and tells a story about how this is a magic soup. And, uh, and uh, you know, he encourages the villagers to just contribute one ingredient. Whatever they have, they're all struggling. They, they find something, they rush back to the houses, come back with a carrot or a piece of meat or something. And, and this process unfolds, people get more and more excited. And then by the end, he's got this delicious bubbling soup and they, they all eat from it and, uh, and enjoy it. And, and they decide the secret is the magic stone, which they try and buy from this guy, but it's not really the magic stone at all. They had this capability all along. So what if we thought of that cooking pot as the unique container that is place? Uh, you know, when we think of regenerative design, uh, it's very much place-based um, in the built environment space. Uh, and and uh, the magic stone is that potential that uh, we all have and, and that it, those ingredients are, are all our individual contributions uh, and, and from each, you know, discipline. Um, and we all enrich the flavour of that soup and, and, uh, and the more that we collaborate and, and, uh, and have a diversity of, of inputs and ingredients, the better that soup is. So for me, it kind of resonated in terms of what integrated design uh, is for us. Um, and so how do, we, um, how do we use integrated design to accelerate transformation? How do we get over, over the hill to, to a new equilibrium point that, uh, that uh, we will find uh, you know, at that point, I think that integrated design just makes sense. It's the best way uh, or certainly uh, represents you know, much of the best thinking in terms of how we design carbon neutral climate resilient, regenerative uh, buildings, precincts, infrastructure, et cetera. So um, just a few thoughts uh, that I had, um, having, having a, you know, applied integrated design on some projects and, and, and you know, uh, worked in the industry for, for quite a while and, and seen some of the challenges, I think integrated design can bring real life and energy into the design process. It's often quite stale, it's quite prescriptive and people are quite jaded. Um, and I think sustainability obviously is, is, can be that campfire in the middle here that draws people uh, together. Um, and it doesn't have to be sustainability, but that's often something that's uniting us, that, that sort of a, an urgency that, uh, that is across our society at the moment. Um, but I'm really interested in um, you know, how we regenerate our design teams. How do they become more exciting experiences for us all. And I, I think integrated design can, uh, can do that um, and unite us around a common purpose. Um, and so there's, and, and can help us achieve our full potential. And it's often the case that as designers, we come to a project which just has a limited budget, limited time. And if you're a sustainability professional, you're told not to, not to put too much sustainability in place because it will just complicate things. So we're not we're not reaching our potential, uh, but but there's and, and there's so much more we can do. Um, it builds relationships of trust and collaboration, and we understand we're working together. We're all authors, um, and uh, we're all learning. Uh, we all have part of the answer. We need each other, um, and um, and we all have um, uh, you know challenges in terms of being able to step up to this challenge of um, of designing. You know, buildings uh, and infrastructure that hasn't been designed before. I mean, we're really trying to turn the industry around and embrace new thinking in a very short order. 
And uh, so we need to recognize that's hard for all of us. Um, and, but I think integrated design can really help with that process. I think it also brings the clients along on the journey, get them involved. You know, you can't outsource this stuff. And I love the fact you know, I've, uh, working on things like Living Building Challenge, where you know, hey, clients, we need you in the workshops. Uh, many of the projects that I've worked on, I never meet the client. There, there are a number of steps removed, um, and uh, that's that's a real loss. Um, and I think Innovative Design says no, the client has a role. I mean, we're designing these buildings that clients are going to operate, so let's have them at the table. You can't outsource all this stuff. And, and I think that gives them an experience and an appreciation and understanding for the project team that they've, uh, that they've engaged. Uh, it's certainly more uh, inclusive and along the lines I was just talking about with the soup, we want that diversity, particularly Indigenous voices and to understand what caring for country means on projects, but also other representatives. Do we have the ecology represented on the project? Uh, do, do, does, does nature have a voice um, and other, other community organisations? And, uh, and often that's crowded out because there isn't enough time uh, and, and that's a real disappointment. We, we all um, are the poorer for it because we don't have those voices at the table. And having clear design principles, goals, outcomes, a North Star, and it's not a Green Star rating or an ISCA rating or any rating, and often that is used as the North Star. It doesn't get anybody excited has been my experience. So those, uh, although those tools are absolutely critical and play a key role, we need a clear strategy. We need to know how we're going to contribute to transformation change, positive outcomes. That's what gets us uh, excited. Uh, we know from studies, that's what gets people uh, to feel like they've made uh, you know, a, a lasting contribution, created a legacy, something they can be proud of. Um, but we need those principles and goals. And, and if you, in an integrated design process says, yes, let's, we need to know where we're going or it's just going to be a mess. So it really encourages a bit more thinking up front around that kind of thing. Um, it also promotes a, um, a systems approach to design and preferably one based on living systems. Um, and uh, my sense is that we don't teach enough about ecological systems and how living systems work, particularly in engineering schools. And I know that most of the engineers I work with don't know much about how living systems work and, and maybe that's part of the problem. Um, but we, we need that systems approach. We need to know how, how things are linked uh, and we need to be able to understand those patterns and relationships and, and, and recognize those relationships are just as important as the components themselves. Um, and this is an exciting area of enormous potential um, and really brings people together uh, around designing in, in, in different ways. But we're all starting from a, a much lower level of knowledge than we should have given the ecological crises that we're facing. Um, it also fosters uh, a, a, an innovation culture that we need to you know, come up with ideas, but test them rapidly, test them in an integrated way. Um, you know, I think uh, you know, being open to new thinking um, and to some extent, we need to set projects up differently. So uh, we don't have contracts that says, please don't take a single risk because uh, you'll be sued uh, and we want you to take on unlimited liability. Uh, and so we, we have contracts that we often are asked to sign that certainly don't say, please be innovative. Please, uh, please take some small manageable risks, uh, quite the opposite. Um, and integrated design, as we know, looks or encourages a, a, a bundled, um, a bundling of costs, looking at integrated systems rather than, well, how much did that high performance window cost? Uh, well, it's how much is this high performance building envelope and, you know, building conditioning system costing us? Uh, because it may be that that high cost window was the lowest cost way to get to a system that was high performance and had the lowest life cycle cost. Um, but we need to bring cost into that discussion in a different way because uh, otherwise we do line item things out and we, we're just being dumb. Uh, this is an industry that cares a lot about cost but doesn't have a very sophisticated approach to costs often and, and that's a real shortcoming. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll posit this, I, you know, I don't have any evidence to, to show it, but, but my sense is that an integrated design approach is the lowest design cost approach when we're dealing with complex, resilient, regenerative systems. If, if people know of other ways to bring design teams together to, to, to come up with you know, clever, elegant, uh, practical approaches to 
to uh, you know low carbon design fantastic but and maybe at some point it'll become much easier for us but at the moment uh, we need an integrated design process to bring people together so we know what we're doing uh, we're working collaboratively or else we just have to redo things and uh, and take step back steps back and change direction many times in a project which costs a lot of money and we don't deliver what the client wants so i think integrated design can be argued as as actually a very pragmatic low cost way to do things when we're up against these kinds of design challenges so uh, my message is let's go make uh, more stone soup uh, it's an exciting uh, opportunity ahead to promote uh, integrated design and um, um, great to see uh, all the contributions being made and, and all of the terrific projects that students are getting involved in. And, um, and that's it for me. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, perfect timing. We've got a, a few minutes for questions, which is really good. Um, again, I might just jump in with one. Um, you know, we're constantly sort of thinking about um, you know, the climate emergency and, and how to battle these things in our day-to-day -day lives. And I know Engineers Declare just had a, an event two years in, sort of reflecting on, on what people have been doing. Um, do you have any comments out there for people who might be listening in as to what they can do as a, an individual in their firms to actually try and um, change things from the inside out? Yes, no, that's a, a really good question. Because um, it can be it can be a challenge. Uh, look, the reason engineers declare exists is because individuals were struggling to get traction in their firms. Um, and and the purpose of engineers declare is to say there's many others out there, um, and you can connect with them. You can you can you know participate in in engineers declare events. But there are many other organisations that we're really trying to um uh give visibility to and encourage people to be part of the regenerative cities movement uh is is one of them and we're seeing many cities in australia step up and and create communities of practice and bring people together um and and so you know there's the opportunity to reach out connect um and be part of a, a whole series of discussions um and um and to be emboldened by the fact that you 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 can often go and, uh, and when you're working on a project, go and check and see who on the design team in terms of organisations have committed to, to engineers declare, architects declare, and often it's most of them. Uh, and so, you know, when, when you're, uh, you, know, right, you, know, you know, working on a project, you know, you should feel encouraged to, to actually say, hey, you guys have signed uh, architects declare, engineers declare. So what if, what if you know, we, we thought about uh, doing this or the other thing? Or, you know, I think it's, um, we've all gone public. We don't actually know the, the solutions, the answers, but many uh, of us across the industry have gone public. Um, and that's really meant to, uh, to, to be a sign of encouragement, a sign that, that yes, you can talk about these issues. They are front and mainstream. Big challenges still, that messaging hasn't percolated down to a lot of project teams, um, but we're, we're on the journey. That's great. So um, yeah, speak up and come out of the closet as a uh, climate activist. Um, Wendy from QUT, I noticed you've got your hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a I have a question. Well, a, a statement actually, just following on from Chris that um, through one of the other iHub projects about healthcare, we've um, in contact with the doctors for the environment, which are all the healthcare practitioners in Australia who have made similar declarations to the engineers and the architects about can we make healthcare buildings better, have less waste. You know, address climate change, etc. So there are a lot of so in the user group bit, um, you know, in the healthcare um, sector, the hospital, the doctors for the environment is another group that could be involved in, for example, integrated design solutions for healthcare facilities. Yeah, absolutely, fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay, right. Well, it's uh, just about on time to hear about the. Um, a couple of the first integrated design studios that were done from uh, Trish and Joe. Um, so Joe, do you want to take it away or Trish? Thanks, Brendan. Um, I've really enjoyed all the presentations that have preceded ours. Um, and actually a lot of the experiences that um, um, the others have spoken about uh, are similar to some of the, the themes that we have in this presentation. So. Um, it's it's quite encouraging that we're all kind of um, going in the same direction. Um, 
Joe and I were very fortunate to lead two integrated design studios last year, um, focusing on school briefs, and our client was the ACT Education Directorate. Um, so we partnered in um, semester one with Arup and Grimshaw as our industry partners for engineering and architecture consultancy. And in second semester, we partnered with Jacobs um, for both the architecture and the engineering component. Um, Joe and I have both come from um, school design backgrounds, having worked in this, this part of, of architectural design for many years. And, um, and I think the success of our particular studio um, was that we partnered with um, other industry um, practices that were so passionate about the environment, as passionate as we were to, to make real change in this space. Um, we initially started on a discussion with our students about why good design matters and in particular why it matters in the school context. And um, we also showed them some research from the Victorian, um, the Office of the Victorian Government Architect that did a year long Australian study um, that quantified the benefits of good design in, in school environments. And so we really started to talk about um, different materials, different volumes and spaces and the feelings that they evoke. Um, just the basic principles of good design, such as adequate um, daylight, but eliminating the glare, um, looking at how students work in a space, considering um, absorptive surfaces so that, you know, you're not going home each day with a headache. Um, all of those practical things that make for a good space that often people that aren't in the building industry just know that a space intuitively works, but they can't quite describe why. Um, our client was a major contributor to, um, I guess, the success of, of our studios. Um, we were fortunate to partner with um, Beth Mitchell um, and she'll be on, on the panel discussion later in, in, today's, um, in today's symposium. But, the ACT government is really um, quite well known for having very progressive um, policy direction. And it's almost like this little petri dish of, of public policy experimentation because you've got that sweet spot that you've got a population under 500,000, generally speaking, very high socioeconomic um, families, and you've got quite a high level of education broadly across the community. So um, all of that coming together has set very ambitious targets for 2024 and 2030 in terms of carbon reduction targets. And really the, the government is looking at all of its government assets as um, eventually becoming electrified and acting as like little mini solar farms and how they feed into the overall carbon credits that the ACT um, government can generate. Um, so one of the initial um, conversations with the students was, how do you develop um, an appropriate design brief? Because we were coming um, at the various school sites that we were tackling from um, like an overarching idea of, of what it would take to be carbon neutral, but we needed to um, break that down into the nitty gritty of how to achieve that in terms of um, a, a building design and then its performance. So we were fortunate enough in the first semester to take the students on a field trip to Canberra where they were um, lucky enough to interview the school principals and the staff and even um, see the students uh, learning in their classrooms as well as the students at play. And that just enabled us to have lots of conversations in the couple of weeks that following on from those um, site visits about what it actually takes to um, create, um, I guess, a framework around the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, our sites, 
there were four sites. The two that we tackled in first semester were Forest Primary School and Macquarie Primary School. Um, and in semester two, it was Canberra High School and um, Mawson Primary School, a bilingual school. But we're only going to talk about two of the two of the sites today due to the brevity of time. Um, so we really felt that for the, for the students to take lessons from these integrated design studios into wherever they ended up within their careers, they needed to understand the fundamentals of site analysis and an analysis of the building structure. Um, with Forest Primary School and with a lot of um, government buildings in Canberra, uh, you've got um, a repeated um, structural form. Um, and so some of the conversations were around, well, sometimes the best things we can do for the environment is not to demolish what's already there. Uh, so the briefs that were developed across all of the school sites looked at both adaptive reuse or renovation, as well as a new build, a new build component. Because we also needed to look at overall master planning so that schools could plan for the short term, the medium term and the long term. One of the students from first semester, Equin Tang, um, produced quite a poetic um, design proposal for Forest Primary School. Forest Primary School is in the parliamentary circle. So you've got a lot of um, parliamentary employees that send their children there. Um, and like many schools around Australia, this school is oriented facing east to west and not north south. So I don't know if you can all see my cursor, but this is the new build component where my cursor is and the adaptive reuse component is the building uh, further above. Um, and with this exploded axonometric, you can see that um, the layering process of all of the various um, mechanical uh, products and components and how they were laid into the design. But the design itself was not about just taking engineering systems and putting them onto, onto um, the architectural solution. It was really trying to develop um, a, an architectural language, a pattern language, and how that then integrated the various um, buildings that were part of this overall design brief um, into a unified whole. So Canberra has scorching hot summers, freezing cold winters, that, that generated a lot of discussions with our students about um, how to make the space that's available work harder for, for the school environment. Um, and I think this is quite a lovely um, render that he produced of the kitchen garden area and all of the classrooms facing it with um, different design elements tackling, you know, two or three or four problems at a time. Um, and then that's just a broader overview um, picture of, of the new builds and, and the courtyard environments that he created. Uh, so a lot of this was also bringing the architecture students um, through the structural design journey of what it takes to use things such as green roofs, so that a lot of these conversations happened very early on. And in touching on um, the initial presentation today, uh, one of the ways we stopped students just leaving everything to the last minute was that we set about six assignments throughout each semester where they had to achieve measurable benchmarks so that they didn't leave everything to the last minute. And in doing so, they really were able to explore all of the advice from our industry partners in, in the one-on-one -on -one crits as well as the, the group crits. Um, Canberra High School was another one of the sites and um, again, very much a, a typical high school. Um, often the landscapes in high schools aren't as beautifully tended as they are with primary schools, which is unfortunate because teenagers really want those little pockets where they can chat and share ideas and just feel part of the community. 
Um, this school had very ageing infrastructure and all of the sites were very carefully selected by Beth Mitchell. Um, given that they had real opportunities to make different choices going forwards in terms of how they renovate with the budgets that they were, were going to receive. Um, so the student we chose to, to discuss today was Sarah McConville. She certainly came at it from um, both a scientific and uh, a sensitive or water-inspired water approach. Um, a lot of Canberra High School feels quite arid. The, um, the soil is, is highly compacted. The tree canopies are few and far between. The ones that are still there are very low or quite poor quality in many ways or poorly located. Um, but these um, donut type buildings with these internal courtyards gave us a lot of scope to um, alter the microclimates and to really make full use of, of the courtyards as um, additional learning spaces for the staff. So she looked at the, um, at the technology wing where a lot of the VCAL um, subjects are taught and her, um, her, I guess, main idea was how to capture all of the rain that fell on the site and how to, to redirect it naturally through the natural gradients of the site. So her response was really about bringing the native landscape and um, the native fauna back into the site and using the site as um, a green corridor. So much of Canberra has amazing native um, vegetation. Uh, and so this was a natural progression of what you'd see generally in Canberra um, brought through the school site and really utilising water as, as a linking element. So some of the things we talked about with a lot of our students was um, doing more with less, uh, being very careful about what they chose to demolish, understanding that you certainly have a repetitive rhythm with a lot of these school buildings that you can utilise to your advantage, and then teaching them about um, the wide variety of, of um, products and systems that are out there that they can incorporate. I'll hand over now to Jo, who'll talk about the approach that we adopted in our teaching style. Thanks, Trish. Um, I guess um, for me, a truly integrated design approach um, looks to dismantle the traditional hierarchy between engineers and architects. And even that subordinate relationship between um, the engineer to the architect who has the big idea and the engineer then solves that problem. So I think um, for me, it's about everyone contributing to that idea. We tried to foster this sort of paradigm shift and um, as much as possible in the studio, we did have some engineering students for the second semester, uh, but only for part of it. So as best we could, we then supplemented that with the consultants. But we try to sort of navigate through the design problem to solve, um, emphasising that shift that needs to happen from an engineering or an architectural problem to more of an agnostic design problem where anyone at the table can solve it. Um, so thank you, Trish, I should say. Next slide. Um, so, so, so we showed them examples of what's possible, what happens when integrated design is in place, and most importantly, that you don't have to sacrifice um, thought-provoking architectural outcomes to achieve integrated design. Um, it's not new, it's just, it's just a focus that it's not always um, on projects because of other factors. Uh, next slide, please. So we also looked at, oh, the one before that, Trish. So we also looked at how, um, uh, integrated design outcomes in um, firms. So in this case, we've got Lions Architects um, and Jacobs Group who provided the building services. Um, quite often, and in this case, um, the engineer um, was working with the architectural concept design already and their contribution to integrated design happened at the detailed design stage. Um, and again, that, that relationship between the subordinate engineer to the architect starts to shift when we, we look at um, 
um, I guess, a, um, an expertise in, in achieving a green star, five star rating. So for this building. Um, but that also comes with mutual respect and that kind of shifts in these types of integrated um, designs. So as industry consultants, um, the next slide I think is trying to come through. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the next, um, so we've provided architectural engineering and sustainability advice. Um, we, we shared that industry knowledge um, through looking at active and passive systems and providing those students with um, a toolkit. So really um, having to give them a lot of information very early in the semester so they can get up to speed and start to think about um, their design proposals in an integrated way. So it was, it was very heavy um, learning up front in the studio. Um, we also instilled that heating and um, cooling are significant contributors to energy consumption and that it's never a substitute for good design. So they, we really focused on a lot of passive strategies. We um, looked at supporting the analysis of their models through, they, they built a, um, a base model, an engineering twin model of the site, and we um, supported them through analysis, um, through energy modelling and live um, uh, modelling software, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, and I guess, next slide, please, Trish. Um, we also um, wanted to explain that you need to look at the whole life cycle. Is the next slide coming through? No. Not sure what's happening, it's bouncing around a bit, but um, yeah, the, just looking at um, the whole life cycle. So, again, when you're looking at you know the green star rating, I guess looking at that whole life cycle, this particular building, um, Swinburne University, the advanced manufacturing center, it looked at early um, integrated architectural concepts of transparency and openness um, that were realized in the architectural expression as well as the environmental principles. Next slide, please, Trish. Um, so with the energy modelling, um, we, it became quite evident in semester one um, where different software was being used that for semester two we would focus more on a consistent modelling software so that for a couple of different reasons it was um, easier to assist all the students but more importantly that they could um, share input data for comparative results. Um, the task that we gave them was to build a digital twin um, of the site and actually um, compare inputs guided by the consultants for the base information and then they would go off and um, research and, and find new material specs and input those into their um, proposed design responses. So it was a very iterative, um, iterative um, way of designing and they could see those immediate results. A um, couple of the images below. So one is a um, student um, exploring improvements in daylight and being able to see that, um, you know, instantaneously really gave them that confidence. Um, they were looking forward to in making the right decisions, um, but also checking in on the aesthetics of those decisions. And that was really important um, for them all. The image on the right um, is one of the students looked at energy usage and um, developed this graph that indicate, indicates um, from a base model, the top bar, um, the level of energy reduction. So he, he got to 33% through improvements of insulation, glazing, and um, um, installing a heat pump. And he, he wanted to go further and um, achieve a carbon neutral um, energy consumption. So he, he looked to calculate how many panels would be required for on-site generation. And he, he was um, one of the few that was able to explain the energy usage in such a way. Um, the, the next slide, please, Trish. The analysis that we assisted the students with um, was to develop the basic couple, couple back, the energy analysis model. <laughs> Um, each building was modelled either in Rhino or Revit and it was imported into a software package called Sapphira. And um, the, our ESD consultant, Will, was fantastic. He supported the students throughout the energy modelling tutorials, both in a group setting and one-on-one. -on -one. 
and um, you can see from, if you can read it, the circles at the top um, indicate different, um, uh, different analysis being, the first one starting from the left is energy usage, um, highlighting that heating and cooling was the major concern, which is in the red. Um, costs, carbon emissions, just an awareness of, of as they were putting in different inputs, what that actually was um, uh, doing to their energy consumption level. So that was um, a great learning and we went through lots of discussions in class as to why that was happening. And the um, mechanical engineer, Lockie, was fantastic and Billy to explain all those um, subtleties. Um, the next slide, please, Trish. Um, so really, I guess with the energy modelling, it indicated that um, a combination of different sort of building fabric improvements, um, whether it's insulation or um, performance um, improvements for glazing, can really significantly reduce building um, energy. But we also looked at life cycle um, of the entire master planning process. So this, this slide here is um, by Sarah. It's what the last student that Trish was talking to who had the water sensitive um, design. She looked at staging sort of for short, medium and long term in her master plan where she would um, start to make changes to the low hanging fruit of improving um, glazing, um, thermal performance, and then moving on to um, actually improving um, the gas-fired building services with an efficient electric pump. So that really made a difference. And um, switching, even though you were switching to electric systems, it increased the energy um, throughout the site, but it could be offset against PV rays, which she installed in that final stage. So it just gave the students that um, longer-term picture of not just um, designing a building, but looking at a master plan. So a longer term view was something else that we really tried to instill in the students. Um, the next slide, please, Trish. Sure, I'm just uh, conscious of time. Do you? Yep, I've got three more slides. Great, thanks. So I'll just skip over this one. Um, and essentially just focusing from the master plan to the detail. And um, I'll, yeah, I'll skip over this. Just they were, they were always checking in against the aesthetics of the detail. Slides are moving around a bit. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Is it funny? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, so look, just really quickly, I guess, um, what makes for a successful integrated design studio? So Fish and I um, taught for the year long and we also learned with the students and um, looked at new techniques of trying to um, have the students um, work in different smaller settings, which we found quite useful, as well as the group settings to get up to speed with a lot of learning. Um, we had a fantastic client, um, really passionate um, and high level aspirations, which came through in the brief. Um, our industry consultants, um, the university and the students all worked together throughout the studio. And Trish and I facilitated as studio leaders. And we basically, maybe the next slide, Trish, we basically have reflected on, um, we've been missing a slide, we, we reflected on um, what the successes were for us. And I guess for this studio, it was very much practically led and um, a lot of rigour in the site analysis and the existing conditions and then testing those existing conditions by developing a base model and um, proposed um, design model. So that really... Um, were the, they were the first two key steps for us. And then I think the third step was really having a very passionate client and team, a multidisciplinary team, including the students, university and the consultants, and really trying to push those boundaries of um, um, siloed thinking into an integrated design response. Um, Trish, did you want to say anything else as a studio leader? Might leave it there because I feel like I'm rushing because we're we're um, running out of time and perhaps can talk through some questions during the panel setting. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add, Trish? No, no, that's it. Okay, cool. That's um, great. Yep, that's it. Thanks very much. Jack. Tried to rush through that. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. 
Um, thanks, Trish, as well. Um, and I just wanted to also thank you uh, for the energy that you both brought to the studio. I think the students were very lucky to have you as um, as tutors, and the, and the results really uh, you know demonstrate that at the end. So look, we'll hold any questions we have at the moment because we'll get the chance to talk about them after Beth's presentation. And, uh, and Beth is the, the other part of the studio. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of a supportive client and Beth, I think, far surpasses that in um, being very knowledgeable about sustainability, incredibly passionate about it, and uh, also brought a lot of energy to the uh, school's IDSs. So Beth, um, do you want to give us the, the view from a client perhaps on the integrated design? Okay, Dwara Nuna, Dwara Nunaul. I meet uh, with you today from the lands of the Ngunnawal people and we respect their traditions, uh, past and present, and pay tribute to, the, to their leaders, both uh, past, present and future. So just a quick run through the context, I guess, for the Education Directorate. Um, I'm the As Director for Asset Strategies within Education and it's uh, essentially my responsibility to assist the Directorate to achieve its emission reduction targets. Uh, the ACT government has 100% renewable electricity through purchase of off-site electricity. So our function is really looking at how we progress towards zero emissions uh, through the reduction in HVAC. So the ACT government has also set a net zero emissions target in government operations by 2045. And the education director has backed this with a pathway to zero emissions. So as we came on uh, to the integrated design studios, one of the key motivators was education as the custodian of our future citizens and leaders, and therefore wanting to demonstrate not only that we could achieve the zero emissions, that we could do it in an, in an innovative way to demonstrate that leadership to our school students. So the opportunities within the education directorate, I guess, with our, our schools, our new schools are all 100% electric. So we really started to look at the 24% of buildings that were built before the 1990s, architecturally pre-modern uh, energy efficiency standards, all the mechanical systems coming to the end of their life cycle, and of course, a new pedagogy since those buildings were built. On top of that, 55% uh, of all of our building stock is built before 1970. So really some of those issues that uh, Joe talked about and Trish talked about where we have old older buildings, but we're not going to knock them down. Uh, we've got a growing population. We need to actually take those buildings into the, the current um, the current century, but also the modern pedagogy. So drivers for, for participation, one of the key things that we found and we find as we start to modernise our buildings is there is a real need to fast track industry approaches and solutions to the zero emission economy. Uh, quite often we go out to consultants and we're seeing the same solutions coming back that don't meet our long-term aspirations. We also uh, really need to have a bright, broad mindset to meet the complexity of the changing climate and the world. We've seen bushfires that have significantly interrupted our school operations, but also now and in, in the last week, uh, my life has been very much wrapped up in trying to make sure that we can supply sufficient fresh air to our schools so that they can operate in the current COVID, that should be 19, um, restrictions and health orders. So this all requires an integrated approach if we're going to deliver the long-term holistic sustainability uh, that the directorate aspires to with its zero emissions uh, targets. So client perspectives from the studios, I guess, uh, how do we lead and how do we teach were, were some of the things that I really enjoyed walking through with the students. We had this opportunity to value the disciplines and to, and to reassess the value of the disciplines and set forward a model where we're harnessing the collective genius of the different disciplines. And I can't undervalue that enough. It, it's one of the approaches that we see when I'm in my day-to-day my -day role where we're looking at policy, infrastructure, the guys that are repairing and maintaining, the guys that are constructing. We need to actually set forward models for the future generation where 
we are acknowledging and harnessing the knowledge of each party at the table and making sure those parties are at the table. So for me, that was a really valuable part of the studios was seeing the engineers, the architects, and in some cases we had students with a real landscape bent and I found that that was even, uh, you know, broadening what our, our vision was of the disciplines and how we harness that information. Uh, as has been iterated a, a few times is the building as a system. Quite often we see buildings as a building separate to the pedagogy, separate to the landscape, and certainly they're the models that some of uh, the government buildings are set up with. They are not an integrated model. And therefore, when we go to make changes to those buildings, we're not coming at them from a systems-based approach. So coming into the design studios and watching the engineers and the architects and the studio leaders really talk to students about the building as a system was a really valuable exercise in, in sort of setting that foundation for how we need to look at buildings if we're going to make them sustainable. Following on from there is sustainable performance as the hero, not necessarily the engineering, not necessarily the architectural form, but the end result, what is it that we actually deliver through this integrated process? And, and for me, that was really around sustainable performance as the hero. Um, and I know we talk about heroes differently in architecture, but in this integrated process, that was really how I came out of the studio seeing um, the hero of this process. And the other most important thing is the students in the design studios are tomorrow's leaders. They're the guys designing tomorrow's buildings. And so the ability to engage them in real world examples I think is is essential in making sure that we set ourselves up for a zero emission future uh, in our new builds. So continuing on from there, how is the education directorate benefited? I guess essentially the access to the thought leaders through the design studio was great. I um, have a career in sustainable development, but being able to talk to the, the thought leaders within the universities and within industry uh, to grow my own knowledge with, with an evidence base uh, was really valuable because it meant that I'm able to then come back into government and start developing frameworks for planning and policy that take on the integrated design approach. And then obviously from there, what we all want to see is this integrated design approach translating on the ground, both to new and old buildings. And so new buildings, I think, are, can be relatively easier, but the buildings we looked at were old buildings with a growth scenario. And so being able to capture what the opportunities were and to understand how industry and thought leaders were approaching those design challenges was very valuable for the directorate uh, in understanding how we need to approach uh, our future modernisations. Coming out of this, the Education Directorate has developed a zero emission framework that, that hopefully embodies some of the connections that we saw and developed throughout the design studios. And this, there's a lot more detail behind this and it's another entire presentation itself, but essentially we're looking at what are those elements and how do I as a client to the studios then transfer this to the policy and development framework of the ACT Government Education Directorate. So this is the framework that has come out of this process, really acknowledging the value of the different uh, key elements and partnerships, I think, uh, coming off the back of these studios is one of the biggest uh, benefits I can see for government in making sure that not just once every five or 10 years we review our processes, but so those processes and our policy and decision-making frameworks are actually being designed, changed and amended progressively uh, so that we're working with universities and industry to make sure that we have the best possible information uh, feeding our processes as we move forward. I guess uh, rolling off that to the next frontier, I guess there was an opportunity, I think, when we walked through the design studios to really build the foundation of ESD knowledge amongst all of the design students. I guess there was a big difference between some of the students coming in with some design 
ESD knowledge. So uh, we saw this particularly with uh, Sarah McConville's work, which I've, I've put on the screen there, where she's integrated not just the built form, um, she's understood water, sen water sensitive urban design. She's understood the really broad concepts of sustainability. And I think in future design studios, if students come to the design studios later in their uh, design studies, and they already have that foundational experience. I think that's where we will see a real growth beyond the conventional and those students starting to really apply more uh, innovative design uh, concepts and, and come up with, you know, potentially designs that we haven't seen before and, and ways of presenting that we haven't seen before. Uh, built and green infrastructure. I think one of the, the key lessons for me, and certainly as the education director, it also has a living infrastructure plan that we're developing at the moment, is saying should we have some landscape architecture students in these design studios to, to bring, to, to step outside the building, built form and into that green in infrastructure space? Uh, because quite a lot of our Schools are, are as, as Trisha said, they're in quite hostile environments. And as you can see in the picture above, this is one of our preschools. And that's one of the key learning areas. I visited this site only last week and we're talking about the heat issues in summer and I stepped outside and said, well, I can see why. Uh, so stepping into landscape architecture or bringing some of those students on board, maybe something we look at in the future. I guess uh, the focus on the practical application is where, you know, I had this amazing experience to be involved with these design studios that really reinvigorated, you know, my thoughts on how do we take this as a government uh, and, and start looking at how do we get it running on the ground? So there is a united front, I think, between research industry and practitioners and clients in saying how do we work together to make sure that we can keep this going, we can keep the design process moving, innovation moving, but most importantly, seeing it integrated into real world practice. A couple of opportunities might actually be for some of the students to be involved in work placements where their initial design ideas are taken and developed further uh, with a with architectural engineering expertise uh, to be developed on the ground. And so they can have, you know, a bit of a portfolio experience there, but also really start to launch the careers of these students who will be tomorrow's leaders. I guess the other thing was really looking at client involvement. And whilst we involve the teachers uh, and myself, there were certain points in time where we touched on being able to get the voice of the students who are using these spaces, uh, but weren't necessarily able to really uh, harness what some of their ideas about the spaces should be. And I think really in high schools, with Sarah's work, she uh, was able to actually go to and talk to some of the students around how they use spaces. And I think that really translated into the outcomes for her work. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to all who participated. Um, it was an excellent experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm really hoping that I can pay tribute to all the students and to the university and partners and help progress this process uh, in the ACT government. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Beth. And uh, yeah, thank you again for all of your support through both of those um, ACT schools, studios, I think the outcomes were, were great for the students and uh, yeah, and ho hopefully for everyone involved as well. Um, okay, well, that, we're just on time to start our panel discussion, which is fantastic. Um, I think we've introduced a few people, the people we haven't met from the panel are Paul Trotter from Fulton Trotter, who's been involved in some of the interstate um, integrated design studios. Uh, Pippa Connolly, who looks after architectural engineering at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, Pippa, I think, is struggling to log in as a panellist, uh, Marie, so I've put her um, mobile number in the chat to you. I don't know if you can help her out. Um, str struggling with the link, I think. Uh, so hopefully Pippa will be along in a few minutes. Um, we have uh, Joe and Trish. Um, Joe Letteri from Jacobs, um, Trish from Stocker Architects, 
who were involved in both of the uh, ICT schools um, IDSs, uh, myself. So I'm an enterprise professor in architectural engineering at uh, Melbourne University and uh, Chris Bunting from, from Northrop and, uh, and engineers at Clare. Um, so there's been some, ah, here's Pepper. It's been some um, really good discussions along the way, and I've got a, a few few questions, and there's some in the in the chat as well. Um, I thought we might just start with the one that Hingwa asked a little bit earlier, because I've seen it come up a couple of times, and that's the question around COVID and how that's impacting um, you know design full stop, I guess, and and how integrated design can actually assist in helping that you know meet the challenges in in a way that's friendly to the environment. Um, would anybody like to jump in to um, make some suggestions in their experiences with, uh, with impacts of COVID on, on design? I guess I, I can. I, uh, the last uh, two weeks of, of our life within Education Directorate has been around getting students uh, or buildings ready to be occupied by students. And it has been a really interesting process in understanding how our buildings are designed and how they need to be designed moving forward. I think there's a lot of, and we talked in the design studios about some of the, you know, schools implementing reverse cycle air conditioning, different systems that don't provide outdoor air. And I think, you know, we've had to sit there and look at the way we've been moving forward and say, okay, our, our mechanical systems have to introduce outdoor air at this stage. But then we also, so there is COVID and then there is also the bushfires. Yeah, so the bushfires, we don't want the outside air. Um, COVID, we want the outside air. And, I, and they, this is the changing world that I think, you know, we need to learn to adapt to and come up with solutions for. So for some of the schools, for example, at the moment where we have spaces we can't ventilate naturally, there's very few of them, or where we want to improve their ventilation, we're starting to look at technologies like heat recovery ventilation. And I think that process, these, you know, whilst these aren't ideal circumstances, they are providing us with the opportunity to drive alternate thinking around where we need to go. And I think in the long term that will benefit uh, the schools and the learning environment. Uh, so a lot of CO2 sensors into the building, mechanical systems, getting them updated so that they're actually working based on those CO2 sensors to bring in outdoor air. Uh, but it's going to be a, a lot of work if once we hit the extreme temperatures. It's okay to open windows and doors now, but once we hit 36 degrees or at the other end of the cycle, once we get into a Canberra winter, it's going to be very difficult uh, to maintain sufficient natural ventilation. That's interesting. Chris, maybe you could comment on that because as a structural engineer, I sort of understand the two extremes of uh, you know, passive ventilation or, or passive measures being one, you open it up to the environment and let air in, which, which Beth, as Beth says, has issues around smoke and, and other things. And then there's sealing everything up and uh, bringing air in and and conditioning it, which is the, the passive house approach, I guess. Um, is, is natural ventilation challenged in Australia? Oh, look, those two systems can, can work together and uh, I, we shouldn't really be in one camp or the other. I think we need buildings that are more resilient. And uh, at this time mm. when we're starting to recognise we need better ventilation because maybe our schools and other buildings weren't particularly resilient, are we starting to use future weather files that CSIRO has just uh, released bunch of files saying here's what the weather's going to look like in 2050, 2070. And my, my experience has been we're not really using those weather files yet. Um, so we, uh, we have relied a lot on natural ventilation and we will continue in the future, but we will need, you know, well-insulated airtight buildings and yes. houses getting traction in, in Australia. Um, and, but you can work with both. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's really um, uh, giving you the, the ability to disconnect the interior environment from the exterior, which there's many times where that's important. And my wife's a teacher, and when it's uh, you know noisy or dusty or you know there's rain outside, or you know she wants to close the windows, um, but she she teaches at a private school and they have uh, mechanical you know ventilation, but that's not true for many public schools in, in Victoria at least. Yeah, th thanks. Um, Pippa, welcome to the panel. 
Um, as someone who I know has had a few years' experience uh, on the ground at the coalface with, um, actually, it's not the coalface in sustainable engineering, it's something else, I imagine, but um, yeah, face to face with both architects and engineering students. Um, and you've been watching the presentations today. I'm just wondering if things resonate with you in terms of the different ways of thinking and in particular, the, the different willingness to be an author in the design process that, that you see at Monash. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Yes, as, as you know, I've, I've experienced the consulting side and for seven years, the um, teaching student side of things and have had the pleasure of being able to teach engineers and architects together, um, which has been really interesting. Um, but yes, I think one of the things that really resonated to me was something that Chris said about the stone soup. I love that analogy. I hadn't heard of it before. But I think that whole idea that everybody has something to bring to the discussion and to bring to the solution is a really, really powerful thought. And I see it time and time again when you have engineers, in, in my case, the engineering and the architecture students working together for the first time. They, they've got their strengths and they automatically jump into it. Yeah, it's particularly comes to the four in concept design where you've got engineering students grab their spreadsheets and the architects grab their trace paper. And on the face of it, the two ideas are very alien to each of them. But they realise that both approaches have strength and how do you actually bring that together? Um, and then once you add, start adding in the other disciplines, and I had the opportunity to bring some mechanical engineers in to the unit at one point, um, and, yeah, it really just those different ways of thinking and just different ideas, different backgrounds, different experiences. Everybody has something to offer, and even, you know, backgrounds, cultures, they all have a different way of looking at things. So I think, to me, the most powerful idea is actually understanding who you've got in your team and what can people bring to it. And most people don't understand what they personally bring to it. At the beginning, they actually have no idea how valuable their contribution might be. So the other thing is trying to give everybody a voice. So actually just draw that out. I think the comment about the soup is a good one, um, but mm. it's particularly important in my years as an architect working with clients is how important they are in developing the narrative about a project and the story about if it's a school, you know, what sort of school are you, who you are, who do you think you feel you are, where are you, and how do your buildings respond to that cultural and environmental context? And, yeah, bringing everybody, everybody should be involved in that process to get an outcome that reflects what the client is about, what the kids are about. I'm talking about schools, but probably any project. So I really echo that, um, those, those comments. Yeah, and I think the, the point about the client being closer to design is also a really good one. You can waste an awful lot of time going off doing what you think the client might want, and then you finally find out that they go, oh, yes, we would have loved that if you'd asked us, but you'd already thrown the idea out. Um, so I think, you know, how you actually get, get them involved enough to help that decision-making process, but not so involved that you never get an answer to anything. But that's that a case balance. of also the way we've been running the studios and the point about people leaving things to last minute, that if you, <laughs> you're trying to get the students used to the idea that, you know, you might be seeing your, your client and your consultants every two weeks. Yes, you go away and you do things, but then you come back to the table and you're all collaborating and you're developing ideas about where this thing is going. And it is iterative and that each one informs the other as you develop the scheme. So that well said. That's great. Um, we've got a quite a long and involved observation slash question here um, in Q&A from Timothy O'Leary. Um, Tim has um, observed that the Building the Education Revolution program highlighted a lot of inconsistencies across the country in terms of education policies and things um, and very varied outcomes in, in terms of design. Uh, and he's just um, pointing out that there's a, a task force recommending the establishment of national benchmarks on predictive energy use and CO2 emissions and the mandatory application of these to all future spend of public monies in, in school buildings. Um, Beth, are you aware of that? Is, is that something you're across or anybody else on the panel? I hadn't heard of that. Um, 
it is interesting because you've got different, I guess, different uh, departments or, or directorates in the case of the ACT have different design standards and also different targets. So I guess in the ACT where we have a zero emission target, there is a real driver for uh, standards to be exceeded. Uh, so I guess, a, you know, a minimum standard associated with federal government funding isn't something that I've heard of, heard of but certainly in the ACT, the, it, it's about exceeding the standards, not, not hitting the minimum. So you also have different policy contexts. So none of the other states that I'm aware of have 100% renewable electricity, and we do, and therefore we're really targeting uh, the elimination of gas, which which presents uh, numerous challenges, um, but it also means that the integrated design approach is even more important because you really need to get the building envelopes up to, you know, a really high standard in order to heat and cool those buildings efficiently, but particularly to heat them because gas is very efficient at doing that. Um, and very quick at doing that. Whereas, you know, when you have a look at a school building, it's not like an office. There's lots of doors. There's lots of windows and things to get left open. Whereas, you know, in a core office building, it can be efficient, really efficient to heat with electricity. In schools, we need to really get the buildings. And I think the word climate resilience we use, Chris, when you're talking about that, and that's exactly what we need to do. We really need to look at getting these buildings to be more resilient uh, to climate change. And I think that is, in the ACT anyway, is there's a very significant body of work to do around the building envelope. So leaving mechanical aside, um, the building envelope really needs to be addressed for, for, you know, and to me that would be the minimum standard because you can bring in a, you know, you can change your heating, your mechanical systems, but that built form is the basis of what you're working from. It's the basis that you're planning your mechanical systems on. If your building envelope is poor, then you're going to have larger systems, higher energy use. Um, yeah, so so for, for me, looking at the buildings on the ground, that climate resilience, building envelopes, insulation, that's really the key to efficiency across our portfolio. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I hadn't realised... Um... ACT, we're on 100% renewable energy uh, quite mm. until you flick that slide up. So that's that's amazing. But mm. it, it, it does open up that whole, um, you know, I'd like to think we've got a lot, a lot of advantages over over the states. And one of them is that we we talk amongst our states um, a lot more mm. than they do in America. In America, engineers work to different codes across different states. Um, so, but, you know, we, we have a, a very large range of our environmental conditions from you know the virtually the tropics and subtropics right the way down to um to tasmania uh and you know that the solutions are going to be very different for, for each state um i'm wondering is, is anybody around the, the virtual table had experience of the, the variation in that and um and how well that's dealt with it it strikes me that we need to be talking to each other more across state boundaries I think there's an issue about um, a cultural issue and about population balance as well within our country in that everybody is generally um, stuck down in that southeastern corner and and it's highly, you know, the, that's where the major density of the population is. But in other parts of Australia, um, we, we're dealing with completely different climates and, and issues. And when we develop national standards, it, all of a sudden it can often become very southeastern centric, which can be problematic. So we've always got to be open to the idea of diversity of design outcomes for our climates. And Queensland alone, um, just the spread of <laughs> things that are happening from uh, Cape York all the way down to southeast Queensland and west of Doomba in the higher areas, yeah, just amazing. So, yeah, very different solutions for different climates. And I think we, we've seen that reflected, Paul, in some of the BER buildings where the BER building, you know, you walk into it and you, it's confusing to see that building typology in Canberra because there's, you know, extensive banks of louvers and, you know, the type of ventilation systems that you would see in the tropics or that I saw when I was in Darwin and Queensland. And to see them in Canberra is, is quite confusing. And to resolve those issues once those buildings are constructed is very expensive. 
I just think on the BR program, BR is actually, I might have read the Orgula report and I was involved in delivering a range of those projects myself in South East Queensland for the, both the Catholic and independent school sector. But there was the issue around the BR was an economic one in the sense of the stimulus that the, the federal government pushed through and the different jurisdictions had lots of different capacity constraints about that and their ability to get that work out in, because it was all rush, rush, rush. And um, some, uh, for example, with the private schools we worked at, they already had the capacity and plans and master plans in place for them quickly to, to move forward with projects under a traditional architectural involved procurement process, and they went very well. Other jurisdictions had no Department of Works. Um, they really struggled with actually in, uh, engaging with the construction industry to get something built, let alone design properly. So it's no mm. wonder, Beth, we're seeing lots of mm. travesties on the design front in, in, in those areas because they, they were just done too quickly. Mm. Yeah, and but maybe, I, I maybe it saved us from economic ruin. I don't know. It, it possibly did, but that aside, I think uh, that is one of the challenges that we have on the ground: is the the perception that to go through these integrated processes and to really take the time and thought process takes too long. Um, and so I see that even on smaller projects where you're looking at it going, no, just wait, just wait. Let's just really have a look at this, what the issue is and understand it from a holistic perspective. Um, that's changing a lot as we're starting to see the delivery of good outcomes from those processes that may have taken a little longer than um, might have traditionally been expected. Uh, but it is, it is one of the challenges is that to think through things properly and holistically and understand the whole suite of the issues on any site um, takes time, but also that time may not necessarily be capitalised on another site because the site conditions are very different and we're working in a framework where there's a desire to have things that are easily replicable mm. and it's not necessarily the case. The orientation is different. The you know, what's happened over the last 50 years on each side is very different and it provides different challenges and opportunities. And I think understanding that that's just the case, that just as is, is the first step in the integrated design process. Yeah, the conditions that are just are. Let's move on from that and then design to that site. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right, Beth. And, um, you know, having seen a lot of these studios happen now, um, Joe and Trish being lucky enough to squeeze in a site visit to Canberra and visit the schools and talk to the teachers um, just before the gates shut on travel. In fact, I think we had a text message from the university stopping all travel while we were on the, the plane on the way home. That's, that's how close it was. But, but it made a huge difference to the students' mm. understanding of the problem and also their engagement into the, the design process, mm. um, in, in my view. Um, I wanted to move the conversation on, we've got sort of 10 minutes left, to something we've touched on a couple of times, both in, um, in Emma and, uh, and also in, in Joe and uh, Trisha's. And that's the, the question about uh, knock it down and rebuild, or do we, do we retrofill? And, and I think that's, that's a huge question and uh, yeah, involves um, life cycle analysis and embodied energy. Um, and as the studios have gone on, the, the tools that we've made available to the students have grown. And, and we do now sort of look at embodied energy uh, a little bit more. But yeah, I, I think it's uh, yeah, now that the the rules have changed around development, particularly in the cities where when we might not be justifying huge new build office spaces anymore, or even uh, I know in Melbourne, you know, very large um, multi-res apartments, uh, you know, the, the pressure to um, make money from our super funds who provide a lot of the money, you know, might actually start looking towards reuse of existing buildings. So might, might start with um, James or Emma. Um, do, how much effort was put in at the front end to look at that decision between um, knock it down and rebuild or, or to retrofit? There was quite a lot of time uh, initially uh, spent by the students uh, and the consultants um, going over 
the the pros and cons of um, that that knockdown rebuild, um, and especially uh, a lot of discussion with um, the the client. Um, so the client being um, an indigenous organization, they were very concerned about the amount of materials and embodied carbon um, that was in that existing building, um, and what embodied carbon would actually go into the new materials that would go onto that site. So they they wanted a, a complete assessment for for any sort of knockdown rebuild um, uh, involved in that project. Um, so the students spent, I think, about a good two weeks um, really weighing up the pros and cons and and looking at their their capital costs and what they could actually afford to do uh, before making a, a finalized decision and moving forward it's interesting and um... on the on the um the first semester project the ribbonwood center we actually really didn't discuss that i mean i discussed it in in lecture content that, about adaptive reuse and and those concepts, but because that building really was in in good condition, it was only the HVAC which was um, was the issue. It, it didn't really come into the discussion. I'm following I, the the issue of of um, of embodied carbon and the question of demolishing buildings. I think is is much more at the forefront in the UK construction industry at the moment, and there's a really big push around embodied energy and architects calling for a new part Z in the building regulations. And, um, you know, you say, oh, that, that, that must be quite a big decision. And I almost think that it's getting to the tipping point where, um, you know, almost like in our design studio and James's position, that you've got to justify the position of de demolition more so over um, reuse. I think that's where we should be sitting and that's where we should be, be driving the discussion. Um, that rather than taking that stance of clean slate um, as as kind of the um, status quo, I think it, it, I think that's where we'll we'll be going and relatively quickly. Okay, it's interesting. I I re remember um, yeah having worked for Eric for a while, and, and they on a couple of different occasions had big drives towards um, making businesses out of. Uh, adaptive reuse of existing buildings and it was really tough to get people on board and, and happening and that that seemed not only from clients point of view but also from the the people working on on the projects and I know James and Emma you're saying that the students found the the blank uh, slate of a new build quite intimidating and and you know there are almost too many options and uh, and then maybe the other way with uh, with existing buildings I was wondering Joe and Trish you had both um, adaptive reuse and new build portions on the schools. Did you see a difference in the way that the students dealt with each each part? Did they enjoy or were they more successful on one than the other? I think that they appreciated both parts equally. I didn't see that they favoured one over the other. I think that they came to the studio already quite passionate about environmental issues. That's what drew them to these sorts of studios in the first place. And we definitely spoke to them about um, how the waste stream has gotten to, you know, a global tipping point, but that Australia's government policy is really um, trailing policy in Europe. And um, one thing that happened in 2020 that was quite timely was that China stopped accepting a lot of our plastic waste. And so we brought that up because it was happening in real time and the impact that buildings and demolition have on the environment and looking at the rhythm and the, and the era of the buildings that we were working on and a lot of things there could be celebrated, could be um, reimagined. So for us, we actually spoke quite candidly about we are in the overall picture. We are not just doing architecture. We are being global citizens in every decision we make as designers. So um, really use your powers for good <laughs> and not evil. So I think for us, we 
we didn't see a huge variance. A lot of the master planning already took into consideration with the students that approached the master planning well, they already took into consideration that they were building something new adjacent to something existing. And the ones that did that quite seamlessly understood that, you know, there was a story to tell across the whole site. Mm. Pippa, you've got your, your hand up. Do you have an observation? Yes, I agree with all, all of those issues in trying to understand the existing buildings versus new building. As Brenda would know, I was very heavily involved in a lot of work around existing buildings and it was hard work at that time. Um, but uh, it certainly it's coming forward now, which is great. But the, the area that I wanted to highlight is um, materials. So materials and resources. If you think of you know, anything that you have in a building is actually a resource and it's how you use it, how you use it wisely but also materials, where do they come from? And I think, you know, that whole idea of the supply chain, it's great having a, a new build or, you know, existing building and doing this incredible design, but if every piece of thing you specify comes from another country or a long way away and isn't locally sourced and isn't, you know, doesn't have that provenance, I think that's something that we really, really need to be thinking about a lot more. And I think people are, um, and that doesn't matter whether you've got a new build or a, an existing building. Um, it's those decisions you make as designers, whether you're an engineer, an architect, landscape ar architect or whatever. So I think that's one thing that every person can bring into their decision-making process. Absolutely. Beth, Beth, you had an observation? Yeah, it's uh, we're currently looking at that same concept in the retrofit of an environment centre that's a single brick building. And the concept we're looking at is the building is a storybook so that we upgrade the building to be environmentally comfortable and, and thermally efficient, other way around. Um, but also so that every element used in that building tells a story and that becomes part of the environment centre's ability to teach. Yeah, so um, they're the sorts of things I agree. I think we need to start having, and it's a small building, but for, for me, every little example we get of that functioning really well and providing a value add to teaching and learning um, within the building um, is, is another really good way to sell what we're doing because governments and, and most clients love multifaceted objectives. So if I go and say, I want to do this because it'll improve the energy efficiency, I don't have as great a chance as if I say, I want to do this because it'll improve the pedagogy, the energy efficiency, the thermal comfort of the students. Do you know what I mean? So, so all of those layers that we can add in this integrated design process value add to the ability of people like myself to sell those concepts um, up the chain um, to governments where policy is made. Well, look, it's, it's a great discussion. Um, I'm conscious that we're at the end of time. I wanted to talk about asbestos with Paul, um, and there's a couple of other raised hands there. Um, I think I might pass over to Marie just to normally let, let people uh, move on, but we might even uh, extend the discussion slightly past it if we can, Marie, for people who are interested in staying on to hear it. Would that be possible? Yeah, of course. No worries. I'm happy to keep the discussion going. Um, Brenton, no problem. Okay, so if you um, thanks for attending. If you've if you've come along, but you've got uh, commitments at two o'clock that you need to head off to, so please head off and, and do those. But if you're you're happy to stay on and listen to a little bit more discussion, then you're welcome to to stay. So, um, Joe, you had your hand up. Yeah, look, it was just adding to the studio, the students and that comment about demolition and that um, we kind of discourage students to do that. <laughs> but there's one that stands out, um, Madeline, I think it was. Um, she demolished the school hall um, because it didn't meet the brief and um, we, we discouraged her and she still came back the next week after she'd thought about it um, and... Um, she could justify and she said that she'd salvage the building material so she was questioning um how she could reuse so there was not a lot of it but i just wanted to yeah say that so when it did happen they did think it through yeah well i might just quickly throw to paul uh for a moment because i've worked on a project for mit where asbestos was a, a huge deal um cost the project a lot of money uh and unfortunately it cost it a lot of money late 
in in the project so it became a problem but became more apparent as we got into opening up the existing building uh is paul still there we lost paul he had to go no uh, we had to go. oh that's no good so um yeah i guess hazardous materials uh an issue and it's one of the other things we we also need to balance up along with sustainability is um health and safety of, of occupants and materials so sometimes when there's nasty stuff like asbestos you're better to actually leave it sealed up and actually not touch it in the first place because it's it only becomes dangerous once you break it up and uh you have the asbestos fibers floating around in the air um all right well, look that was uh a great discussion and uh, i've really enjoyed the um, presentations myself. So thank you to all of our presenters, um, making time and putting effort into that. And uh, and thank you to everyone who's come along and been a part of the conversation. And uh, we are going to pick up um, tomorrow at the same time. Um, uh, links should be out there and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you then. <laughs>